Hello readers, Annie Duke is a best-selling author, an expert on decision-making, a former pro poker player, and the founder of the nonprofit The Alliance for Decision Education. Her newest book is another good one. It's called Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. Annie, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you, Trey? I'm great, thank you. So this is the second chance that I've had to speak with you about your books. And I got to tell you, you are one of my favorite authors uh, to read who really just writes so eloquently about the art of decision making. I got to tell you, I love Quit as much as I love the previous one as well. Do you feel pretty good about the end product here? You know, it's interesting. <clears throat> I think that Thinking of Bats, which was my first general audience book, was was a book that I'd been thinking about for a long time. In fact, it's part of the reason why I quit poker was because I really wanted to go and free up a bunch of time to be able to write this book. Um, so in some ways, that's like my baby. It's like my first child, you know. But what comes comes with the first child is like we all know that you get better at parenting as you go along, right? And so either better or more indifferent. Well, I think that may be true. That may be true. It's like, oh, it fell on the floor. Fine. It wasn't the peanut butter <laughs> side down. Go for it. Um, but um, but I do think that you get better at, you know, as you go along with experience. And and obviously, like thinking in bats is so special to me because it it was really something that had been born of like many, many years of thinking about that topic. I like quit. It, it quits really kind of my favorite for the reason that I think I got a lot better at writing. Hmm. From from writing these books, you know, so I would not when I when I wrote Thinking in Bets, I would not have called myself a writer. It's not what I would have thought of myself as. And I think through in particular the amazing um, advice and guidance um, and editing of my editor at Portfolio, Nikki Papadopoulos, I've just learned to become a better writer. And, you know, and and so then, I you know, I just look at this book and, and I love it. I love it. I love the topic. I think it's my best writing um, and I'm really happy with it. And I hope other people will get excited about it too, you know? Well, I think it's an important topic because we as humans just have a hard time stopping doing something. And I know you cover this throughout the pages, whether it's a comfort zone thing or whether it's just admitting failure, admitting that you may have made a mistake that's hard for us to do. So to have a guidebook now to really help you understand how to be better at something like that, I think is is crucial for folks on the whole. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a huge variety of reasons why we have a bias against quitting. Many of them have to do with uh, cognitive biases that we carry with us. Um, you know, for anybody who's read like Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, for example, people are probably familiar with a lot of cognitive biases. But when you when you actually look at a lot of the biases, it turns out that they bias us against quitting. We can talk about that. But I think there's this broader issue, which has to do with uh, just really the the negative connotations that come with quitting. So when we think about the people who persevere, they're the hero, heroes of the story. They're courageous right? Like stick to pluck, metal, you know, having what it takes, all of those things. And those are built into the aphorisms that we think about, like quitters never win, winners never quit. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again, you know, never give up. That would be from Churchill. Um, and when it comes down to it, like we think about grit as almost synonymous with character, right? But what about quit? Like if I call you a quitter, Trey, am I am I complimenting you? Sure doesn't sound like it. No, I'm like calling you a loser. <laughs> right. And and so the quitters are are really, you know, they're the villains. They're the cowards. In fact, there's actually, this is kind of fun. There used to be a synonym. There's an old word word that meant quitter, which was uh called poltroon. And it was such a bad insult that you could say to someone that back in the 1800s, it was grounds for a duel. <laughs> so somebody, somebody, um, it's in my book, I can't, I'm just blanking on the name, but they they challenged Alex, um, sorry, uh, Andrew Jackson. They called him a poltroon in print. He challenged them to a duel, um, won, shot him dead, and still got elected president of the United States. That's pretty crazy. So, I mean, this, right, like, so, I mean, this is this is how incredibly negatively we view the word quit. But the fact is that like one is not better than the other. It's all context driven. 
So you want to stick to things that are worthwhile, even if they're hard. That is what grit gets you, right? The thing you don't want to do is stick to things that aren't worthwhile. But sadly, that is also what grit gets you. It gets you to stick to things that aren't worthwhile also. And the skill is in telling the difference between the worthwhile things and the not worthwhile things and living a life where you stick to the worthwhile things and you quit everything else. Those two concepts, while seemingly diametrically opposed, are really two sides of the same uh, decision. It's a fascinating concept. Now, I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy, Annie. Not just the end result, but really the art form of what it takes to get to that finished product. Sure. Each joke and uh, every joke put together to make an entire set. How did Richard Pryor show <laughs> that even the all-time greats understood the value of quitting at times? Yeah, so first of all, let's just put it out there. Like quitting doesn't mean like leaving the court altogether, right? Like if you're a comedian, quitting doesn't just mean quitting being a comedian. There are all sorts of acts of quitting that we do every single day, right? Like we're on a road and there's a traffic jam. So we switch to another road. Like that's an act of quitting. Um, when you think of uh, agile software development, like push out products, see if people like it, if they don't quit it and move on to something else, you're not quitting the vision of developing the product. You're not necessarily shutting your start startup down. You're just, you're just quitting the stuff that isn't working in order to do the stuff that will, that will get you to that broader goal. And that's true for comedians too. And they really understand that these smaller acts of quitting are really important to success. So there's this great documentary um, uh, on the Comedy Store, which was uh, this very famous small club in LA that was, it was so uh, important that basically you couldn't get on Johnny Carson unless you... Uh, they saw you on stage at the comedy store. So like it was small, but powerful. So Richard Pryor, after he was already quite famous, right? Like probably the number one comedian in the world. Um, when he was about to go on tour, which he would then develop into an album, um, he would actually go to the comedy store. And obviously they would give him stage time because <laughs> he was Richard Pryor. And he would get up the first night and totally bomb. Like he'd be being booed. Because he would go in there with kind of half-formed ideas, nothing really totally, written, you know, figured out yet. And he'd just try stuff. And he'd get booed. He'd sort of figure out, like, what's landing, what's not landing. And what didn't work, he'd throw out, which was almost all of it. And then the stuff that got a little bit of a titter, like, you know, that people seemed to glom onto, he'd sort of start developing that. And he would do this, like, literally, he'd appear, like, every night for like 30 days at the comedy store in order to work out his 45 minutes of material that he would then take on tour and turn into an album. And I think that that's such a great example of the power of quitting is look, don't try to make it perfect in the first place. Cause you're not going to know a whole lot, like go try stuff, the stuff that you don't like throw out and just quit it. And the stuff you do like start to develop it and stick to it. Researchers studied New York City cab drivers in the 1990s to learn about their concept of quitting. What exactly did they learn? Oh, gosh. Well, OK, so they learned two things. Uh, the, the thing number one that they learned was that uh, we stick to things too long under certain circumstances, uh, particularly the circumstances are when things aren't going well. Now, that's weird, right? Because if things are going well, you'd think that would be the time that you should quit. But actually, that's the time that you stick, which is sort of one of the big findings of half a decade, half a century of science is that we, when things aren't going well, that's exactly when we double down, like when we escalate our commitment. But they also found out something interesting. So um, if you think about all the advice about quitting, you know, all the aphorisms, they're all pretty negative, except for one. And the one that's positive is quit while you're ahead. Okay, so now we have one piece of advice that's like, okay, quitting is good. Quit while you're ahead. But it turns out that's really bad advice because it gets you to do something that you already do, which is actually quit while you're ahead. But if you're ahead, that means things are going well. It's something that's worthwhile and you ought to stick to it. So what do New York City cab drivers have to do with this? Well, this is work from Colin Tamara and colleagues, uh, one of them, including uh, Richard Thaler, who's a Nobel laureate. Um, they studied trip sheets from New York City cab drivers. These were in the days before Uber. Um, and basically the way that that worked was the cab driver would rent the cab, like lease out the cab for like uh, 12 hour shifts. And they could choose when to drive within that 12 hours and when not to. They generally weren't driving the whole 12 hours. Um, and the researchers looked at the trip sheets. And what they found was something very strange, that when the fares were very slow, 
So there just weren't a lot of riders around. The drivers would drive like forever. They would just like keep going and going and going and going, even though they weren't picking up a lot of fares. But when there were lots and lots of fares around, when there were lots of riders to pick up, they quit really fast. Okay, so that's really weird, right? Because you would think when there's lots of fares, you, you would keep going to make the money. And when there were no fares around, you would stop and you would get out of your cab and you'd say, today's not my day. I'm going to come back another day. Now, this was a very costly error. If they had done what a rational person would do, stay in the cab when there's lots of fares and quit when there's not, they would have made 15% more money than they actually were making with the strategy that they were employing. So, and in fact, interestingly enough, if they just said like, I'm just going to drive six hours a day, they would have made 8% more than they actually made. Like, even if they just sort of were like, I'll just drive for a certain amount of time. All right. So the question is what was going on? Why were they quitting early when there were lots of fares and uh, quitting late when there weren't? And it's because they had an earnings goal for the day. So let's say they wanted to make $300 for the day. Um, well, if there's lots of fares around, they're going to get to that 300 really fast. And now they're ahead because they made their goal and they quit right away because quit while you're ahead, right? But but obviously, if the fares are slow, then it's going to take a long time to get to that 300 if you're ever going to get there. And so that caused them to stay in the cab really long. And so now we can see the two errors, right? When things aren't going well, we tend to stick. And when things are going well, that's actually when we're more likely to quit too soon. So both pieces of advice are bad, right? Quit while you're ahead is terrible, but also if at first you don't succeed, try, try again is bad advice because you need like, unless the thing you're trying is really dumb, like you're tone deaf and you're trying to become a professional sing singer, then don't try, try again, please quit. <laughs> Well, it's not every day I get to quote the uh, the classic 1990s cartoon DuckTales, but Scrooge McDuck used to say, work smarter, not harder. And it sounds like these cab drivers, and let's be honest, a lot of other people have a hard time with that for what you just mentioned. You have a goal in mind. Once you reach that goal, you're like, cool, I'm done for the day, but you're not taking into account that there are going to be slow days in the future, so maybe you can work ahead just a little bit and maybe make double of what you were planning on making that day. And perhaps that gives you a day off in the future. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, as I said, if they had actually been rational about it and kept driving when the fares were good and quitting when the fares were bad, they would have made 15% more money than they were actually making. It's crazy. You know, and I think one of the things that we think is like, well, uh, if you're incentivized, you know, and obviously the drivers are trying to make a living, that you're going to make rational choices about when you stick and when you quit. But you can see here that you don't. Right. Even though they would have made more money with a different strategy, they're not finding that strategy for themselves. And that plays into what I think is a, a great quote of yours in this book. Quitting on time usually feels like quitting too early. And the usually part is specifically when you're in the losses. Yeah, that's exactly right. So let me explain what in the losses means. So uh, it's a cognitive phenomenon, psychological phenomenon, where uh, any time that we feel like we're uh, we've lost or we're short, we right. So it could be like in the losses in the sense that I I bought a stock at fifty and it's now trading at forty, right? So I'm ten dollars in the losses, right? But until I sell the stock, I'm not. I haven't lost. I'm just in the state of losing at that point. But what I think is really interesting is that this is really a cognitive phenomenon. So if I buy a stock at 50 and it's trading at 75, but then it goes down to 65, I am also in the losses because it's not rational as to like, well, I bought it at 50 and now I'm actually making $15. It's I used to be at 75 and now I'm at 65. And the other thing is like, there's all sorts of places where we can have made progress but we're not counting ourselves against the progress. We're counting ourselves against like how short we are of a goal, right? So like if you're running a marathon, you're supposed to run 26.2 miles and something happens to you where at mile 16, say you injure yourself. Like objectively speaking, you've gained 16 miles. I can't believe how many people you cited that broke their lower legs and continue to run for the next 15 miles. It happens. It's like four people alone in the 2019 Mar uh, London Marathon did it. So, and it's weird, right? Because this is where in the losses is such an important concept because they, if you, if that happens on mile 16, you have demonstrably gained 16 miles. You've run 16 miles more than zero, except that we think about ourselves as in the losses. In other words, 10 miles short of the finish line. 
right? So that's why I'm saying it's a psychological phenomenon. It's not like it doesn't map necessarily onto objective reality. But whenever we're in the losses, we don't want to quit. Because if you think about it, as long as I keep doing the thing I'm doing, maybe I can turn it around. Maybe I don't need to be in the losses, right? So even if I break my leg on mile eight of a marathon, if I keep running, maybe I can finish. And then I don't actually have to lose, at least in, com- you know, fail in comparison to the finish line. If I hold the stock onto the stock that's trading at 40 that I bought at 50, maybe it will go back up and I can actually win, right? Because in the losses means it's the moment that you quit where you have to turn that loss on paper into a, a realized loss. That's when you know for sure that you can't recover the cause, that you can't make it work. If you leave a relationship, that's when you're saying, I can't turn this around. It's never going to work. I can't find that happiness with this person, right? If you leave a job where you're miserable, that's when you admit that you can't turn it around. When you quit the marathon, that's when you admit you're never going to make it to the finish line. And that's like such an incredibly hard moment for us as human beings. And we just don't like to do it. So, you know, this Richard Thaler talks about we don't like to close mental accounts in the losses. And, and that's really what he's saying is we don't like to walk away when we're short. Yeah, I think that an offshoot of that is uh, having to or having pumped a whole lot of money into a project that you are not necessarily seeing the results. It's hilarious that you actually cited the example of the California high speed know, rail right? line with the scathing, I'm ahead of my time <laughs> with the scathing piece that the New York Times came out with a, a week or two ago. But that's another great example of just committing yourselves way too much into something to where you have a hard time quitting it because you've already committed this much of a resource into trying to make it happen, even though it's obvious to everybody that it's a failed effort. Yeah, so this goes um, in part under something called the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, So the sunk cost fallacy was first identified in uh, 1980 by Richard Thaler, who I've already referred to. Um, And basically it goes like this. When we're trying to decide whether to continue an endeavor, we take into account what we've already spent. Now, why is that a problem? Because I, you know, this the the thing with a lot of these biases is they feel kind of rational, uh, but it's not because that doesn't seem like. Well, why wouldn't I take into account what I've already spent? Well, because you've already spent it. What actually matters is should you spend another dollar going forward? So we can take the California bullet train is actually a good example. They they floated the uh, a bond of nine billion dollars to start construction. Um, with a total estimated budget of $33 billion. And the project plan was to start building flat track in the Central Valley. So I think the first piece of track they were going to build was between um, Madera and Fres- Fresno, I believe. But I, I could check that in my book. I could be wrong. Um, but it's on flat land in the Central Valley. Um, the idea was that they would have that completed pretty quickly. They were going to start construction in 2010. The line would be partially operational by 2021 and actually it'd start generating net positive revenue. Right. So that was they floated the bond. Now, first of all, construction doesn't even start till 2015. That's a bad side. Um, so they're way behind schedule. Um, somewhere around 2016 to 2018, all of a sudden they notice a problem. I mean, it's going to sound kind of absurd, but there's two big mountain ranges, the Tachapi Mountains, which are to the north of L.A., and the Diablo Range, which is to the south of San Francisco. Um, Remember, they've started building on flat land, so they're spending all this money on the flat land. And somebody, a genius, says, hey, wait, we might have a problem blasting through those mountains because they're in seismically active areas. So these are going to represent enormous engineering challenges. They now, at that moment, revise the budget up to $80 billion. Remember, they have no track built at all, right? So this goes to Governor Newsom, who now has the choice to quit, right? He can say, I'm stopping the project, but he doesn't do that. He says, no, let's keep building that track, and then we'll build track between Bakersfield and Merced, and then we'll also build track between San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Notice none of that tells you whether you can actually blast through these mountains, um, the last budget that I saw was I, before the New York Times article was revised upward to $105 billion instead of 2021, because obviously it's not operational. I think the new target date is like 2033 or something like that. 
uh, for it to be operational. And then I think the New York Times said they had already revised the budget up to something like $130 billion or something like that. Now, why are they doing this, right? Why won't they stop? This is a sunk cost problem. They've already spent something like $9 billion of taxpayer money on this. And what do people always say in these situations? Well, if we quit, we'll have wasted the taxpayers' dollars. We'll have wasted the $9 billion. And that's the reason to continue on. But that's that's the fallacy. That's That's the problem. Because it doesn't matter. You already spent that. What matters is you're thinking about spending over $100 billion more for something that you don't even know you can complete because you don't know if you can blast through those mountains. So the real waste is continuing to spend money before you solve for the engineering problem that the mountains represent. And if you're trying to come up with some sort of green solution for California, you also, what could we do with that $100 billion besides continue to build this train, right? So this is a really good example of what the sunk cost fallacy does is the fear of wasting something that already has been spent causes us to continue on and waste more. And we have to think about these things as a forward-looking problem. Is it correct for me to put another dollar of taxpayer money into this, particularly in comparison to the other things I could spend that money on? I'm glad you just mentioned trying to figure out the biggest problem with this puzzle, and that is blasting your way through two mountains to make the track happen, because that plays into what I think is my favorite concept to have learned about in this book, Annie, and it has to do with monkeys and pedestals. What does monkeys and pedestals refer to? Yeah. Okay. So this is a mental model that comes from Astro Teller, who's the CEO of X, which is Google's in-house innovation hub. And it goes like this. If you're trying to train a monkey to juggle flaming torches while standing on a pedestal, I mean, Trey, like you'd make a lot of money doing that, right? <laughs> so if, you, if that's how you decided that you're going to make your money, um, don't build the pedestal first. You should figure out if you can train the monkey to juggle the flaming torches. Why? Well, for two reasons. One is there's literally no point in building the pedestal if you can't train the monkey to do this, right? Because that's that's the whole act. Uh, But the second thing is also you already know you can build the pedestal. So any money that you spend or time building a pedestal is really false progress, even though it feels like progress, because you're not finding out anything new. You know you can already do it. Um, So essentially what monkeys and pedestals tell you is start start with the hard stuff first and beware of false progress, right? Because you want to get to these decisions really quickly. From, From Astro Teller's perspective, If they tackle the monkey first, try to solve the hard hard part of the problem first, maybe they can find out that it's not worth pursuing in $2 million instead of $9 million. He doesn't consider that a waste of $2 million. He considers it a saving of $7 million, right? So let's now apply this to the California bullet train. Well, if you were approaching this in 2010 as you were beginning construction, right, using monkeys and pedestals, you'd say, what are the pedestals? Well, the pedestals are any track you're building on flat land because you already know you can do that. We've been building railroads on flat land for, you know, 200 years. That's not a tough problem. The problem is the seismically active mountain ranges. Those, that's clearly the monkeys here. Separate from that, there's also some NIMBY issues, which would represent monkeys. But let's be honest, it's these, these two monkeys which are the the Cali- the the Tet Chopping Mountains and the Diablo Range. So if you were to use Astro Teller's approach, you would start with a feasibility study of the mountain ranges, an engineering feasibility study before you ever build built any track. Now, don't you think the taxpayers of California would be much better off if that's how they had approached the problem? But the thing is, and I saw actually a defense because of that New York Times article article from somebody on Twitter saying, no, it's totally reasonable that they started on the flat land because it was easier. You know, and this goes to when, you know, when, when you're in a team meeting and you're thinking about a project and people say, what's the low hanging fruit? Like, let's tackle that first because it was easier is a terrible reason to start there. If there's something really hard that you don't know that you can solve for tackling the low hanging fruit is a ridiculous place to start because you already know you can do it. So because it was easier, which feels like such a good justification, is a terrible justification, because then if we go back to the sunk cost problem, now you're generating time and effort and money that you're putting into something that doesn't even represent progress, which is going to cause you when you actually discover that the problem is really hard and maybe you can't solve it, it will stop you from quitting because you won't want to have wasted what you already spent. 
It's a concept that makes a ton of sense. Hopefully it uh, resonates with folks listening right now as well. Chapter 8 is titled, The Hardest Thing to Quit is Who You Are, Identity and Dissonance. By now, Annie, many know the story of Sears. Started in the late 1800s, retail giant throughout much of the 20th century, although cracks started to form in the 1970s. And now the company is just a figment of our memory. They are no longer in existence. Filed for bankruptcy a few years ago, and they are out of the retail business altogether. What many, I think, at least uh, I didn't realize until reading Quit, is that Sears actually had a chance at one point about 30 years ago. What was the self-inflicted inflicted wound that Sears incurred that essentially sealed their fate, but otherwise probably could have kept them going? Yeah, so I think that the problem that people think about with Sears is that uh, you know they they were fit, flailing around and then they ended up you know, quitting the business, which is declaring bankruptcy. But that was actually forced upon them uh, because there was no other choice, which is an interesting thing about quitting is that we usually won't get to the decision until we have no other choice. But Sears was like, you, we have to understand how big Sears was in 19, in the 1950s, it represented 1% of, of US gross national product. I mean, it was a huge company. Okay, so the question is like, what happened? How did they go broke? Because we know the story of Sears, the retail company. Well, this is the amazing thing and why this is the actual story, like a lesson about quitting. In the 1930s, when they had, when they, that was when they first really opened their retail locations, people were driving to those retail locations. So cars were kind of new. And they realized, oh, you know, when they're coming to buy their pots and pans and their shoes, they also may need car, car insurance. So they founded a company called Allstate Insurance, literally inside of Sears stores would sell people insurance for their cars. Now, I'm sure like I didn't know this, like people don't know that they that they were the founders of Allstate Insurance. Allstate Insurance obviously ended up to uh, going on to become the largest insurer for personal liability that there is. I think the last time I checked its market cap was like 40 billion dollars. OK, so huge company. Sears owns it. They created it. In the 1970s, they acquired Dean Witter, which was a very big financial services company. That was acquired uh, by Morgan Stanley. And at the time, it represented 40% of Morgan Stanley's um, total market cap. Uh, they also founded the Discover Card so that their, their customers would have credit. Um, and they um, bought Coldwell Banker. So yeah, you just shook your head. Like So the question is, how on earth did they go bankrupt? And it's a parable of quitting <laughs> that caused them to go bankrupt. So what happened was that in the, you know, starting along in like the 70s and 80s, the Walmarts and the Kmarts start coming along in the 90s, the Targets. So they're pushing them from, you know, out from the bottom. And then from the top, the Nordstrom's of the world, the Neiman Marcuses, those kind of higher end retailers are also pushing them down from the top. And so they sort of lose their place in the retail ecosystem. And by the early 90s, they're no longer the number one retailer anymore. So it just that's the decline that we sort of remember. Well, the, the shareholders realized that, that there was this drag on the business. They had this booming financial services business, but there was a drag on the business, which was the retail companies that were really faltering and losing money at that point. Um, and they said, you got to do something about this. So the board went off and thought about what to do. And they came out with, we're going to get back to our retailing roots. And they sold off all of the financial services companies in order to try to save the retail business. Now, from the outside looking in, that seems so absurd. You have a failing part of the business, the retail, and a thriving part of the, the business, the financial services um, part of the business. So why on earth would you not just sell off the retail side and keep the financial services? And the answer is because of their identity. Because we don't think of Sears as a financial services company, we think of them as a retail company. And the fact is the hardest thing to quit is who you are. You know, whether it's a business like Sears, which identifies itself as a retailer, that's their identity, you know, or you and the ideas that you have, the things that you do, the jobs that you hold, the relationships that you're in that all become part of your identity. And even when the facts on the ground tell you that you ought to quit beliefs or your job or, you know, whatever it is that's become part of your identity, we won't do it because we'd have to walk away from who are, you know, who we are in some way. And uh, not all examples are bad. You get a great, a great example of the Philips company. They have uh, light bulb fame who uh, figured out a way to let go of their identity and not just survive, but thrive in current times as well. Highly recommend people check the book out for that and uh, plenty of other reasons. All right, last question, Annie. 
Uh, the aforementioned Daniel Kahneman, the uh, Nobel laureate, uh, you got to talk with him in this book. You asked him what the secret was to being a good quitter. His response is, what everybody needs is a good friend who really loves them, but does not care much about hurting feelings in that moment. I love that quote. My question, though, is is how cool was it to get uh, Daniel Kahneman to provide a blurb for the uh, front cover of this book? That's pretty freaking awesome. I mean, you know, I'm not going to lie. It doesn't suck. <laughs> Dan, Danny's a really wonderful person. He's he's so generous. He was very generous with his time for this book. And I'm, you know, I mean, I'm so grateful and so pleased um, that his his blurb is on my book. I, I think about me as a child imagining uh, someone of Danny's stature, you know, a Nobel laureate saying anything nice about anything that I've done. And well, you can see, I mean, I'm just the smile on my face. It's, <laughs> it feels really good. I'm not going to lie. Uh, was that was that just a flex also calling him Danny a couple of times too? Like that's how good a terms you guys are on <laughs> that you get to call him Danny now? Well, the thing about him is like everybody calls him Danny. So okay. it's not like really special to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. She is Annie Duke. The new book is an excellent one. It's called Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. Annie, thank you so much for the time today, and thank you for this book. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thanks to you for hanging out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day. <laughs>